in the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. It is 100% real. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the NSA. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to the Curious Dimension podcast. I am your host, Matt Barone. I want to thank everybody who has been following the show and leaving comments. The feedback has been extremely positive. We are already up to episode 11, and I have a lot more on the way. If you guys have a minute, please hit that like button, that subscribe button, and leave a comment. I would love to hear what you think about the show. My guest today is Dr. Elk Joe Hasselhoff. Dr. Hasselhoff has a PhD in theoretical and experimental physics. He was born and educated in the Netherlands. Dr. Hasselhoff worked at many research institutes, including Los Alamos National Laboratory. He has published dozens of articles in peer-reviewed scientific journals, such as Journal of Applied Physics and the Physical Review. Today, we unpack Dr. Hasselhoff's theory of accelerated motion towards relativistic velocities, as described by Newtonian mechanics. We also discuss the possibility of advanced civilizations interacting with the Earth and how UFOs would use advanced form propulsion. Dr. Hasselhoff also has studied the crop circle phenomenon for over 10 years and has an interesting take on that particular subject. Without further ado, enjoy the show. All right, El Joe, we are rocking and rolling. How are you this morning? I'm um, actually afternoon uh, over here. Oh, that's right. And um, you're about six hours ahead of me. Yeah, we're in the future here. And the future <laughs> looks quite rainy, I'm afraid. We had about six months of rain. And then we had one and a half day of sunshine. And now it's um, been raining for like 14 hours nonstop. So I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> it's getting me depressed. And uh, we, we have a house in Italy. And uh, the weather is much better over there as well. So uh, uh, we're, we're in Italy. In Netherlands. Where in Italy? In the north, in the, in the mountains, in the Alps, the Dolomites. Very wow, nice. beautiful. Yeah, it's right in the middle of a national park, and it's absolute paradise there. It's, it's amazingly beautiful. Wow, oh, amazing. I've been to Lake Como. I've been to Milan. Oh, yeah, Lake, Lake uh, Como is beautiful, too. Lake Como is a bit to the west compared to where we are. And, mm. uh, but uh, uh, we are uh, about 200 kilometers to the, well, to 300 probably to the east, but it's similar. You know, we have lakes and mountains. The mountains are the same. So, uh, yeah, yeah, you know what it's like there. It's, it's very, very nice. Love to get started here. Um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about your work with, uh, with your theory of relativity that you found that error and that paper <laughs> that you wrote, um, I was going through it and, um, yeah, I love how, how you're using Newtonian mechanics and geometric models to narrow down what Einstein was, was postulating all those years ago. Why don't you tell people a little bit about yourself, who you are, and um, yeah, and how you came to this work. Okay. Um, my name is Elcio Hasselhoff. I've been uh, into the theory of relativity for a long time. It started when I was about 16, when I had an argument with my high school teacher because uh, uh, I thought he was wrong. And um, yeah. a few years later, I started to study physics uh, at the University of Twente in the Netherlands. And then I finally discovered that actually my, my, my teacher had been right. But there was something in the theory of relativity that never quite convinced me. So I've been thinking about it for a long time. And uh, only last year, I finally managed to, to understand the theory at my level. And, and, and as a result, I came up with a kind of a variation, a different version of the theory of relativity, which I think is much simpler and, uh, which also, uh, brings forward a couple of very interesting thoughts. So I've been, uh, a physicist all my life, I guess I started as an experimental physicist, uh, um, in, uh, actually a couple of Dutch research institutions over up to Los Alamos national laboratories for a while. At a certain point, I went into medical industry, but um, mm -hmm. physics has never left my brain, really. I've always said once a physicist, always a physicist. So from that point of view, I've been into this for a long time. And, um, and finally, after 
decades um, understood the theory of relativity. Maybe we could get into some of the geometric models you're using there with your with your theory, and, and what what is the error that you kind of saw in Einstein's Einstein's work? Well, maybe I should go back to 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 explain what exactly the theory of relativity is to start with. And in fact, it is a, um, a theory that was developed at the early 20th century uh, as an um, alternative model to what we call classical mechanics. Classical mechanics essentially is the physics that you learn in high school. It's the physics that describes the, uh, the motion of objects. So that's cars, airplanes, but even planets around the sun. Um, and that was a model that was developed by uh, Sir Isaac Newton back in the 17th century. And that model works fine most of the time or, or uh, many times. Um, but in the year 1887, so that's uh, 140 years ago, uh, two American scientists, Michelson and Morley, um, discovered something very strange that could not be explained with the uh, classical mechanics, with the, with the Newton theory. And there was a the fact that the speed of light is always the same. And if I phrase it that way, you might think, well, what's the big deal? I mean, speed limit on the highway is always the same as well, right? For everyone. But um, it means that the velocity of light, so the, the speed of a light wave, is always the same for every observer, regardless how fast that observer moves himself or herself. And that is very counterintuitive, because if you're driving a car at 50 miles an hour, another car is approaching you at, say, 30 miles an hour, then that other car will get closer at 80 miles an hour, right? It's sort of the velocity is be added up. And with light, that's not the case. If you, um, if you have a light wave coming towards you when you're standing still, uh, it approaches you at 300,000 kilometers per second. It's amazingly fast. But if you would move towards the light source at 100,000 kilometers per second, you would think that the light should come to you with a velocity of 400,000 kilometers per second, right? Because it comes from two ways. And interestingly, Michelson and Morley discovered that this is not the case. Uh, if you're standing still or moving forward, moving backward, light waves always approach you with 300,000 kilometers per second. And that doesn't seem to make sense whatsoever. I mean, that, that's completely counterintuitive. And then um, it was... Uh, particularly Einstein uh, and other scientists as well, by the way, who developed a theory that could explain this. And that was the theory of relativity. And um, essentially it was a couple of pages full of algebra. And then at the end came a couple of formulas which replaced the formulas um, get provided by, by Isaac Newton for distance, for time, for um, acceleration, for velocity, and all those kinds of things. And the interesting thing was that Einstein had this alternative theory and said, okay, uh, light waves always approach you with the same velocity. If you're moving forward or backward, it doesn't matter. And that can only be the case if, and now comes the weird part, if moving objects get shorter. So that's one of the uh, conclusions of the theory of relativity. Moving objects get shorter. And that means that if you have a car, which is five meters long, when it's standing still, it will be shorter when it moves. Uh, not by much, but it will be a little bit shorter. Uh, and if it would reach speeds comparable to the speed of light, then it would get much shorter, half its length or even, even a fraction of its length. Even more um, counterintuitive is the fact that the clock at the dashboard of that car will tick slower as the car moves. So when it's standing still, it, it ticks at a certain rate, one tick per second. But then when the car starts to move, the clock slows down. So time slows down. And that's another very famous finding of the theory of relativity. Time is slowing down when objects move. And um, that seems like science fiction. As a matter of fact, many science fiction movies use that theme, right? Time travel and that kind of stuff. Uh, however, um, it's been demonstrated experimentally um, many times. Actually, it's even the modern technology of GPS systems, so coordinate systems, uh, nav navigation systems, use this, this phenomenon in order to correct for the, the, the time that slows down aboard the satellites that circle around, uh, around the Earth. Hey guys, I just wanted to take a quick second to thank everybody who's been tuning into the shows. Uh, if you haven't already hit that like button or hammered that subscribe button, please do that now. It really helps the algorithm to let this show reach a wider audience. And uh, yeah, please leave me a comment in the bottom. I'd love to hear what you guys think. Much love, guys.
And they've proven uh, that by like little fractions of the time using the satellites, right? So, but then they can extrapolate yeah. that out well, over. The, the, the satellites go pretty fast, but by, by no means uh, close to the speed of light. But you need to be extremely accurate in your time measurements because like, one, one billionth of a second is already like, like, uh, I don't know, 30 centimeters or something. So if you're off by a few microseconds, you end up away from your destination. So you need to correct for that. And that's in fact what happens. So the fact that time is slowing down is not, I mean, it's, it's, it sounds weird, but it's been, uh, demonstrated many times and is actually, uh, something we have to take into account for, for contemporary technology. Mm -hmm. Now comes the interesting thing, that is that the theory of relativity has been around for, uh, well, a hundred years, more or less. And I never felt comfortable with it, really. It, it was, you know, um, there was always something that wasn't quite right. And like I said, I've been thinking about this since I was 15. And the thing is, with that, you have the theory of Newton, which is 17th century physics. And that's perfectly uh, applicable when things move slowly. So we're all earthly speeds, but even satellites and rockets and uh, space flights to Mars and so on, you can use Newtonian mechanics or classical mechanics. But if things start to move really fast, for example, uh, in particle accelerators, the way they have them at CERN in Switzerland and uh, you know, even uh, astronomical objects very far away, uh, classical mechanics no longer works. So then they use the alternative theory, which is Einstein's theory of relativity. Now, the, the theory that I developed and, and published in, in the paper, um, I think it was about a year ago, a little bit less than a year ago, essentially uses Newtonian mechanics, so 17th century um, Isaac Newton physics, to explain relativistic effects, so to explain the contraction of length and the slowing down of time and all those kinds of things. And I think it's a very interesting paper for three reasons. Um, First of all, it's much simpler. It's a much simpler theory and the derivation is much simpler as well. I mean, we use essentially first year of high school physics, uh, that that's sufficient to, to do the derivation of the model. And uh, in addition, the model is very intuitive. And if there has anything been non-intuitive, it's a theory of relativity because it doesn't seem to make sense at all. Right. But I think my version is quite, not only simpler, but also very intuitive. It sort of makes sense. At least to me, it does. Um, and the second thing is that it, it, it removes a couple of inconsistencies, uh, things that, that don't seem quite right and not very elegant in, in, in uh, the uh, traditional theory of relativity. Um, and the third one indeed is in fact that, that I found one formula, which is uh, different from the one that uh, Albert Einstein's uh, theory uses, so uh, which is in all the textbooks. Um, and mine is a little bit different. And when you, it's very funny if you run into that, then of course you think you made a mistake somewhere. But, um, like I said, the mathematics is so simple. It's almost impossible to make a mistake. I mean, it's never impossible making it three times in a row is not possible. So as a matter of fact, I figured out that the, um, the formula that we're using these days is actually just the formula for the, the way in which time slows down when, when an object accelerates all the way to, to speed of light. Um, that it needs to be corrected. And that is because there is an assumption in the theory of relativity. They call it the clock postulate. And that assumption yeah. is wrong. So yeah, there's a little no, error that I'll ask you a question question before you go on there. I just want to ask you a question. So the clock postulate you're talking about here, yeah. are you referring to like the, uh, the light clock that he uses in his model of a, a photon uh, going back and forth between that, a certain distance? The, the, the theory of relativity, um, comes up with a couple of formulas and one of them is the amount by which time slows down in when, when an object is accelerating. So you have a spaceship, mm -hmm. which is launched from earth and it goes up in the sky and it keeps on accelerating all the time and it has like a super engine and can just accelerate forever. Um, and then because it's going so fast, ultimately the time will slow down. Well, that's, there's an expression for the time. Uh, the, the amount at which the time slows down. And the clock postulate says that um, all these relativistic effects only depend on the uh, momentaneous velocity of an object. So if you have an uh, object at a certain velocity, you only need to know the velocity in order to predict these relativistic effects. It doesn't matter if at the same time the object is speeding up or slowing down. In other words, acceleration doesn't play a role. And that is the clock postulate. So it basically says that only the velocity is important 
um, to determine the time contraction or the time, uh, the, the time uh, dilation, I should say. Um, and the acceleration is not relevant. And, and that assumption is, is not correct in my opinion. And if you take it into account, then the eventual formula is a little bit different. Now, the interesting thing is um, I, uh, I proposed this to a couple of peers and they told me, well, the clock quotient has been, has been verified experimentally at least two times in experiments back in the 50s and 1953, I think something. So there's a couple of papers out there that have tested this, this formula essentially and say, well, it was correct. But then I looked at those experiments and it turns out that, um, let's say my formula, and that's called Einstein's formula, the traditional formula. If you put it in the graph, you get two curves, which are almost the same, only at the very end, they start to diverge a little bit. And those experiments that had been done were performed in the area where the curves are overlapping essentially. So the difference is about half a percent and the accuracy of that experiment of those two experiments was in the order of a couple of percent. So the measurements were not accurate enough to, to see this difference. So I suggested an alternative experiment and well, I hope they'll do it one day if it's possible. And then I really expect there will be a difference that cannot be explained with the tradition of the relativity, but can be explained by mine. What type of uh, pushback have you had from colleagues, the scientific community? I mean, you're challenging something <laughs> that's uh, been around for yeah. quite some time and by someone who's well-respected, Albert Einstein. So what sure. type of pushback yeah. have you had? So, and, and, and so do I. Um, uh, Albert Einstein was, uh, I think, an incredibly creative person. And he was also very modest, I think. I never met the guy, obviously, but um, what I like what you can imagine is that when, well, Michelson and Morty performed their experiments and they, they did this weird observation that the speed of light is always the same, you know, it doesn't matter if you're coming towards the light or moving away, moving, that doesn't make sense at all. So I can imagine that when they first saw that, they went like, Hey, Michelson, are you sure that you're, yeah, Morty asked him, that can't be true. Oh, let's try it again. Yeah. And I can imagine that the first time they published the results. People would go like, they probably didn't build that machine right. And you know, they made a big mistake. I mean, this, this can't be true. And Einstein was the one who, the first one actually said, okay, well, those guys are, are good engineers and scientists. So if they measure that, it's probably the way it is. So let's see what it means. And then he started to work on the algebra and he did like four pages of formulas and came up with the alternative expressions. And it was a theory of relativity. So it was his modesty, essentially accepting that things are the way they are. Which, which made him develop the theory of relativity. But um, getting back to your question, yeah, yeah. Uh, my peers have reacted in, in, very, in many different ways, um, all the way from you should get a Nobel Prize until you should be burned on a stick, I mean, and everything in between. So yeah. I think that's a compliment, I don't know. Um, the point is, you know, it's not about being right or wrong. I, I ask everyone to read my paper and, 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 and look at the difference that I found. And like I said, it, it's not like my theory is contradicting anything. It's not like uh, my theory is not in agreement with all the experimental findings so far. Every single experiment that has been done to verify the theory of relativity is in agreement with, with my theory. Uh, the formulas are the same, except for that single one. Um, so there, there's no problem at all there. The only difference is that my theory is much simpler. Like I said, it's more intuitive. And particularly, it casts uh, a completely new light on the way our universe could work. And I think that is the most important or the most, in, most interesting part of the theory. You know, they, the results are the same and the formulas are the same, but the thoughts behind it are very different. And I think that's where the, where the interesting um, part of it is. Super interesting. Um, are you familiar with uh, Eric Weinstein's uh, theory, a geometric model of the universe? Just a little bit, not much. Oh, okay. I was wondering if you could uh, shed some light on that, but um, we get to, we can talk go in a different direction. Uh, I was curious about that. I know he's working on his his theory of everything sort of a model. Yeah, um, I know there are there are a few other. I mean, it's not the first time that 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 I that, that this I, the ideas in my theory have been have been proposed. I, I know there's others that are have been thinking along, along the same lines, and the problem is that. Um, we all seem to have a lot of trouble getting in touch with the, with the scientific community, because like I said, the reactions in my case have been very mixed because those, but those were people that I knew. Uh, and and I, I, I tried to publish my paper in, in a good science journal, actually one of the most prestigious journals there is. 
And I think it was a little bit naive because if you start your, well, if in the introduction of your paper, it says that there might be something wrong with Einstein's formula, then of course, you know, <laughs> many scientists will no longer read it. So I've been a little bit naive in that respect, I think. Um, I got it published eventually, and I don't think it's really important in which journal it was, has been published. I think more important is that people can access it, you know, they, they can read it and, and, and figure it out for themselves and we can get the discussion started started um, together. I, I'm, I'm interested in some of your topics on time travel and the uh, edge of the universe. Um, you know, and we have these, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Well, that is, um, yeah, th that is, that is the fascinating part. Um, and like I said, the interesting thing is that although my theory is in perfect agreement with all the observations and all experiments so far. The thoughts behind it are very different, and I must admit, I've I haven't done everything. You know, I've done I've done a part, and there's much more work to be done. But the whole time travel thing is something which my theory uh, considers a little bit different than than Einstein's theory does. If you read about the relativity, you will read that, uh, like I said before, if you put a clock aboard a spaceship, and then the spaceship starts to move at a very hard, uh, a very high speed that the clock slows down. My theory says a different thing. I mean, the clock doesn't really slow down, but the observer sees the clock slow down. And that is because as soon as, as objects or observers start to move with respect to another, they can no longer see each other in the present, in, in, in the now. You know, I mean, you and I experience now as being the same now, okay? Although, well, there's probably some delay because we have an electronic connection between the two of us, but, um, and even for light, it takes some time to travel from, from you to me, but, but there is a now, you know, and, and there is a past for both of us. And that is only true as long as we're both standing still with respect to one another. As soon as, as you start to move with respect to me, or I start to move with respect to you, we can only see each other in our, in, in the past. So if I start moving like this, you will see me a fraction in the past. You can no longer see me now. And it is not because it takes time for, for light to travel from, from my body to your eyes. It's just an inherent part of nature. When you start moving, the now is gone. You know, there are only pasts for, for, for each other. And that effect gets stronger uh, if you move faster. So the faster I move, the more you will see my past and the more I will see your past. And that is actually what you see and what we see in the satellites that are moving and that we have to correct for. It's not that they're going slower, it's just that we're seeing them slower. And that's at least what my, what my theory says. And if you talk about time travel, then, you know, there's this famous uh, story about the astronaut that boards an airplane and move, flies to Andromeda or some faraway galaxy with a tremendous velocity and um, he travels for about a week and in his time, he comes back to earth after a week. And then the earth is like 1000 years in the future, 100,000 years in the future, something like that. You know, that's um, a famous story. And, and I wonder if that is true or, um, I don't know, quite honestly, it's, uh, I haven't quite figured that out, but I do know that, uh, that if this astronaut is moving away, his time is not going slower. And he's still at the same time and, and as, as, as our time. And that's, that's Newtonian mechanics, right? That's classical mechanics. There's only one clock and one clock ticks. And that's same, still the case for, in my theory, is only one clock is only one time. Right. And what time is my time and time is his time. Except when I right. watch his clock, I see his clock in the past. So I don't see his clock now. I also cannot see him at his current position. So I will see him actually at an earlier position. And that's all related to perception. So the way we perceive our universe, and that is, I think the, the crux of my model, all the things we, um, uh, all the weird effects of, of uh, relativity are only a result of perception. It's not really that we're seeing the world the way it is, but we see the world it seems uh, to be. And mm -hmm. that sounds a bit vague when I tell it that way, but I think the essence of my, of my theory is that uh, what we see in our universe, uh, so we look around, we see a three-dimensional space. You know, I see trees, I see building spaces, uh, the sky, uh, I see my PC, my laptop, my desk, everything. That in fact is not what it really is. What we're seeing is a projection. It's a three-dimensional projection of a four-dimensional reality. 
Um, so I'm saying in my theory that, that the universe is not three-dimensional, it is four-dimensional. Now, it's important to notice that is not the, the space-time that the traditional theory of relativity uses. Mm -hmm. They use space-time, and that is x, y, and z, plus um, time. Those are the four coordinates. That's like a four dimensional, but it's not the same amount, not the same units. It's meters, 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 and seconds. Mm -hmm. In my theory, it's four times meters. So it's left, right. That's one dimension. Forward, backwards is the second dimension. Up and down is the third dimension. And then there's a fourth dimension, which is perpendicular mm -hmm. to the other three. And it's a spatial dimension. So you could put the measuring stick in it and measure things. So it's the thing is, we can't see that. You know, we don't see that fourth dimension because, well, I've never seen it. No one has, but it doesn't mean it cannot yeah. exist. It also doesn't mean you can't perform mathematics in it. So what I've done essentially in my model is I've used this four-dimensional space and four-dimensional universe. Again, four spatial dimensions of which we only see three. And then I perform classical mechanics. So I just take the 17th century formula, you know, the distance equals velocity times time traveled. And, and acceleration is uh, the change in velocity by time. So the simple uh, Newton formulas for, for classical mechanics, but I apply them in a four dimensional space. And then I calculate the shadow, the, the uh, projection. So I calculate the projection of whatever happens in four dimensional space into three dimensions. If you do that, yeah. it's very simple. That's actually just the theorem, uh, theorem of Pythagoras. You know? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. That's the formula. The only formula you need. You apply that, you calculate this, this projection, and then come out all the formulas that Albert Einstein uh, presented with the theory of relativity. They're identical. And those are long formulas. I'm saying if you have a formula of only three letters, like F equals M times A, then it could be a coincidence, right, that it happens. But these are formulas with square roots and fractions and all kinds of stuff. It's not a coincidence yeah. that these come out there. Impossible. And like I say, it only requires the, the theorem, theorem of uh, Pythagoras, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. That's all you need to get all these formulas out there. Um, so that sort of convinces me that it is more than just a mathematical exercise. I really believe that what we see around us is a three-dimensional projection of a four-dimensional universe. Uh -huh. Whereas it, it all falls, falls together so perfectly, it all makes perfect sense. Um, the thing that um, the Lorentz contraction, for example, like I said, that if you if you move, that things get shorter. I mean, that doesn't make much sense, right? That, it's not intuitive. Why would something get shorter when it moves? But if you think mm -hmm. about, um, well, I can have you give you a demonstration. This this is my phone, right? It's rectangular, and when I move it like this, it sort of turns into, well, there's mm -hmm. perspective deformation. But you can see it gets shorter, right? Mm -hmm. If this is the length like that, then it's got shorter when I twist it. Well, this is exactly what happens to your Lorentz contraction, according to my model. So there's an object uh, in three dimensional world and it rotates in the fourth dimension. So it rotates in the dimension we cannot see. And that's why it, it looks shorter. It isn't shorter. If I look from that way, it's still the same length, right? But this is what happens in three dimensions. So it's, you're looking at the three dimensional shadow of a four dimensional um, a reality. And that simple thought, which already, by the way, was suggested 2,400 years ago by Plato, right? Plato already sort of suggested that it was the case. Well, that's exactly what, what seems to be the case, in fact. And if you uh, do some simple math on it, you can, uh, you can use 17th century physics to explain the theory of relativity. It's amazing, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. It's, uh, Sometimes the simplest, uh, simplest formulas can, can extrapolate to very complex ideas. Well, and, I'm, um, I'm wondering, I send himself, no, the, 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 the simplest model is usually the best one. So in that respect, then we're good. Yeah. And I'm wondering if that can be applied to some of the strange phenomena that we're, we're seeing in our skies. I mean, you know, we could take well, the conversation a little bit, a yeah. little bit, uh, a little bit here. Ways. Well, that's uh, an interesting uh, remark. Uh, you're making now because um, uh, another thing that 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 is interesting uh, about my theory, particularly for 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 specific uh, areas of interest, uh, is in fact that if there's a four-dimensional universe, you know, four spatial dimensions, then there are also four three-dimensional universes that all together make this four-dimensional universe. Like with X, Y, and Z is what we see, but there's a fourth one. There's a W, right? 
So the X, Y, Z, W dimensions, that, that's the universe. Well, we see X, X, Y, Z, but there also is an X, Y, W space, which is also the same three-dimensional space that we see, but it's another one. It's like a parallel universe. There's X, Y, uh, hold on. There's X, Y, W, and then there's Y, Z, W, and anyway, there, there are four of them. So there are four three-dimensional spaces that together create this four-dimensional space, which is the real universe. And according to my theory is that if you would accelerate all the way up to the speed of light, then, well, the theory of relativity, the traditional theory says that's not possible because no object can move at the speed of light. My theory says, yes, it is possible, but no one can ever see it. There's something different. It's in agreement with the experiments. You can never see an object reach the speed of light. It doesn't mean it cannot reach the speed of light, except we cannot see it. But in my theory, it can actually. And when you do that, then you can move from the X, Y, Z space into the X, Y, W space, for example, if you start moving in the Z direction. So if you would have a spaceship that's fast enough or ha has enough energy aboard and enough power to accelerate all the way to the speed of light, I think that by the time you reach the speed of light, the current universe you see around you, the X, Y, Z universe disappears and you end up in the X, Y, W universe. It's like a, a parallel universe. And if you talk about strange objects, and for example, there are these weird videos I saw a long time ago of flying objects in the sky that just disappear like that, right? I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with them. Yeah. Uh, actually, there's an interesting one somewhere on YouTube where you see, it's essentially just a flying saucer, you know, the one you use. Yes. Disc that's floating there somewhere in China. And um, all of a sudden you see it sort of move sideways, disappear, and then boom, it's gone, you know? And, well, if you stretch it a little bit, you would say, well, if that thing accelerated up to the speed of light, it would disappear into this parallel universe, into this X, Y, W universe, right? It would be there. We wouldn't be able to see it because um, one of the dimensions is gone. They couldn't see us, but if they know how to do that, how to make that jump, one way would be to accelerate at the speed of light. Well, that gives a lot of uh, technical issues for us, at least, maybe for them, whomever is controlling the spacecraft is less of a problem, I don't know. But um, yeah, sure. Uh, I think once you have this theory, it sort of uh, builds a bridge between uh, science and call it the paranormal or pseudoscience or fringe science or whatever. It opens up new pathways to come up with rational explanations for these kinds of uh, of strange observations. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's. I mean, if 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 all of that is real and and the, and the UFO phenomenon is real, then something or someone has figured out a way to apply a theory like yours or someone else's to where they can either accelerate, like you said, to the speed of light, or maybe they're bending physics as we know it to manipulate that extra dimension where they wink in and wink out of our perception. Um, you yes, know, absolutely. And that, of course, is uh, a technical problem that we don't, well, we can't solve yet. But at least having the, th the theoretical model that in principle is possible is a step forward, right? If you only have three dimensions, then you cannot disappear out of into another dimension if you don't know what it is. And, and this four-dimensional universe sort of opens up a way to have uh, three other universes where you could go to. You know, there's, there's three other ones, so you can even choose which one, which one you're going to. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, I mean, there's tons of different theories on why these things are, are, are kind of inundating our skies since the nuclear age, but maybe it's to, because we're starting to reach that point and we're barking down the right track. And so they show themselves in little bits just to, to spark the brains that might theorize how it works. And then possibly it sets us on a track to, to maybe get there one day. Yeah. Um, quite honestly, I might, I've, I, I've always been interested in the UFO phenomenon, clearly, like every, every normal person, I would almost say, but I've never been really studying it that much. Um, but I tend to think that if there are actually uh, extraterrestrial intelligence or, or, or uh, technology or creatures or beings that, that are visiting Earth, and, and why wouldn't that be the case? I mean, you know, it's perfectly feasible. Um, I, I, I don't think they would... I would think they see us like, like, like insects, you know, I mean, we walk through the woods and there are all these beetles and, and ants and, the, and they're living there and they maybe see something pass up there and which is us humans. And they start to speculate our, 
other other life forms other than ants or beetles in our in our universe. Um, and some people say, yeah, they're called humans, and they say, oh, come on, you're crazy, you know. So uh, I, I tend to think that that most of the things we see are sort of if they're intelligence, if if they're if they're aliens, if you want to call, if you want to use that word, then then they probably do their own business there, and and sometimes we see them and they don't care. They see us, they know we're there, and they're doing their own things, and and they're not trying to show themselves, but well, they don't uh, they don't want to hide themselves either. You know, they're just doing their own things, and we happen to see them every once in a while. That is currently my, yeah, but and again, I don't know. You know, it's yeah, I don't know. Yeah, no, it's impossible to know. But yeah, you, I mean, if you think logically about how we treat animals or, or lesser species than ourselves, it's it's very applicable to that. I mean, if there's a higher intelligence out there, they're just going about their business, you know. Yeah, sure. Probably, and and I know there are people right. going uh, like, you know, if, if there's an alien life, life form or, um, or, or if, if there's a god, you know, maybe it's the same thing. I don't know. Uh, why, why don't they manifest themselves? Why don't they talk to us? Why don't they show themselves, you know? And it's the same as, uh, uh, saying, you know, wh wh why don't we manifest ourselves to the, to the beetles on the tree or, or to the ants or the insects, you know, um, we don't care. And even if you wanted to, uh, how do you introduce yourself to a beetle, you know, and, uh, or, or to an ant or to an insect? How do you tell a fly that you exist? Hey, hello, fly. I'm human. I'm a common piece. It doesn't work, right? We don't speak each other's language. We have a complete different level of perception. So we don't bother. And, and that's probably why, why the same way they, 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 they look at us. Or maybe yeah. not. I, I don't know. Maybe there are some of them that actually try to do something, but um, most of the time, I think they're just, it's just happening. Um, but like I said before, uh, many of these phenomena, the, these things disappearing, things appearing, uh, and even then, like for example, in the Bible, the, there are stories about different people disappearing or appearing. And actually, there are many, many um, uh, accounts of, of, of people appearing and disappearing. Uh, in, in throughout the ages, you know, and, and it's something that seems to come back all the time as well. People appear, people disappear, people are gone, objects are gone. It, it's something that seems to happen or everybody made it up all the time, which is less likely, I think. And well, now at least with this theory, there is, um, like a theoretical backbone that could explain where they, wh where they went to, where they went into the X, Y, W, uh, space, maybe. <laughs> yeah. I, I just to, just to pull on this thread a little bit more, and then we can we can switch gears if you want. This is a thought I've had, and maybe you can shed some light on this. If let's just say hypothetically that we're we're dealing with something that uh, an intelligence that's coming from very far away, another celestial body, for example. If they're coming here, they're probably not coming in a straight line. They're probably using some sort of advanced physics, like like some of your models you're talking about. Um, but if that is the case, is it a foregone conclusion that time travel and interdimensionality is just a uh, a part of that. I mean, cause you always hear the argument, you know, or are these things extraterrestrial? Are they interdimensional? Are they time travelers? Could it be all one in the same? I mean, if you're coming from really far away, is not interdimensionality and time travel a foregone conclusion? Um, well, that's an excellent question. I think nobody knows the answer to that, but you can always speculate or sort of try to put some logic into that. Um, in, in, in my theory, uh, the way it works is that the, the only reason that we experience time and, uh, and distance is because we are mortal. We are, you know, because we are, we are sort of, we're trapped in a, in a mortal body. So we, we're an object, you know, we're, we're a mass. And that means that we are, uh, in my theory, it means that we are moving through the universe at a speed of light. Uh, and that is something that many scientists will sort of, will sort of step on the brake when you tell that, because uh, according to like the, 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 the um, traditional theory of relativity, no object can ever reach a speed of light. Now, that's another thing which is different between my theory and the traditional theory of relativity. But in, in my theory, all objects we see, so you, me, your house, the world, the planet, solar system, is all moving at the speed of light with respect to a point in the center of the universe. Um, and you're moving through the side because we are part of that object. So that's why we move. And the fact that we move also, um, ign ignites time. We are moving through this space and that actually allows the molecules and the atoms in the body to, to change and to do things. So that's what sort of drives molecular reactions. 
that in the end is what makes us get older, what makes things move. So the fact that we are moving at the speed of light is, is actually the clock ticking. As soon as you stop moving, then two things happen. Time stops for you because you, it's, it's gone. You're no longer going through the space and there's no longer an engine that makes time go forward for you, uh, for your spiritual, for your spirit, your soul, whatever you want to call it. And the second thing is that these three dimensions that you see and the fourth one you don't see uh, is something of the past. I mean, all of a sudden you will see all four dimensions at the same time. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I think that, that as soon as you get rid of your mortal body, uh, well, I know one way of doing that, but some people say there are other ways of doing that. So sort of, you can sort of transcend into a higher level of consciousness, whatever. Uh, as soon as that happens, then you see all four dimensions at the same time. And you can also go there on it at the same time. So you're, you're, you're no longer caught in this one three-dimensional space uh, with the clock that's ticking. The clock is no longer ticking and all the four spaces are accessible at the same time. So then you can move anywhere you want. And if then you know how to go back, you could go back to, to, to any universe, any of the, four, of the three others, to any place in the universe, and it wouldn't take any time. So, you know, if it's into time travel and then aliens, then there's probably some spiritual component there that allows them to move out of the mortal body or, or of the physical body then still have consciousness, still know what to do, go somewhere else in this four dimensional space and then sort of rematerialize in one way or another. And, 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 and yeah, if, if that's the case, and uh, this is a giant leap, of course, from, from my paper, but at least there's, yeah. there's some kind of theoretical backbone that would uh, allow uh, uh, thoughts like this. So it's, it's probably something, something in, in that matter. Um, having said that, by the way, uh, it comes to mind that if this is really true, uh, so if, if it happens that when you get rid of your mortal body, you see all the four dimensions at the same time, and there's no time, it also means you can see all of time. Um, uh, you, you see like the future, the past, and, and, and everything at the same time. It's, there's, there's no longer a past and a now and a future. It's, it's all one. And actually, this was an uh, interesting, very interesting uh, remark that my, my mother made, um, my mother had passed away two years ago and, um, the last days of her life, she was sort of in a help state of being still alive and being somewhere else, you know, somewhere. And, and she told me, and this, this, these are classical stories when people sort of see old family members that passed away a long time ago, the same hap happened to my mom. She saw her brother and her, her parents mm -hmm. and, and she came back and said, oh, I saw, I saw the grandpa and I saw. And at that point, you don't know if it's true or not, or fantasy, or it doesn't matter, you know, it's just the last days of work, but it's a known fact that many people before they pass away, come with these, with these stories. And then my, my mom said, yeah, it was so weird. She said, you know, I'll show the world is not at all what it seems to be. It, it's completely different. And that triggered me very much because I've been thinking about this a lot already. And I figured, well, the world is not what it seems to be. It's just a projection of a four dimensional world. I never told my mom about that because it's physics, right? So you, but she said, the world is not at all what it seems to be. It's very, very different, you know? And it's interesting because I met grandpa, I grabbed my mother, but then she said, but you were also there. Can you imagine? So I was also yeah. there. So I was, I was there. I was somewhere in the future for her at the same time. I, I'm still alive, okay. <laughs> but then she said that, that all the people that passed away were, were there and I was also there and her, her grandchildren, so everything was there. But and then you could sort of say, okay, well, the poor woman was dying. She had 60% oxygen in her blood. What do you want? You know, at the same time, it's exactly what my theory would predict. In fact, that, that you got into a state where past, future, and everything is just one big thing. Uh, uh, yeah. And that case, I would also be there because it's the future, but the future is the same as now. And it's the same as the past. Eventually, if you're outside your mortal body. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah. This is not the third time. But... Yeah. Interesting. Food for thought. Yeah, and it's the first time people have postulated that theory or had come back with stories like that. Um, are you familiar with the work of uh, uh, Ian, the late Ian Stevenson and Jim Tucker at the University of Virginia? To some extent, yes. I've not really studied it thoroughly, but um, to some extent, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they, they've, they've cataloged, I think, thousands of cases of past live um, personalities that young children perceive to mm -hmm. remember. Yeah. Um, 
they have thousands of case studies, some of which are very compelling. But I mean, if you look at that and you extrapolate what happens, like th does, does there some sort of personality or energy survive past this human body? If it does, time is probably not a constraint. I mean, if they're remembering that and they can see loved ones, um, yeah, I mean, that, that fits into your model as well. So. Yeah, it does. And I think that is an interesting side effect. Um, I mean, strictly from the scientific point of view, I think it's interesting for the reasons I just mentioned, right? It's simpler, it's intuitive. Um, and, and actually casts a new light on, on the way that you learn. You, it suggests a new, a new way of explaining how the universe works with three-dimensional projection. But at the same time, it, it, it creates a, a canvas for all kinds of explanations for, for the Call the paranormal and including the things you just um, you're just mentioning. And no, I, I'm aware. I mean, I've, I've read about it, and, and I'll tell you, I also have memories that I couldn't possibly have myself. So yeah, there's some strange stuff going on that is definitely for sure. There's not what yeah. I think it is that is clear, or what most people yeah. think it is. Yeah, for sure, there's something else going on. I, I'd love to get into a little bit of your work. Um, with the, with the crop circle phenomenon. I don't know what your opinion is on it, but um, I know you've done a little bit of work with that uh, some time ago. Would, would you mind kind of talking to me a little bit about what you did and, and, and your thoughts on that? Sure, yeah, uh, it's true. I've, I've spent a considerable part of my life on crop circles and I'm still following the phenomenon and I'm still looking into it, but uh, I think I've done everything I could um, with the means I have um, and there's nothing I could do any more without the considerable funding that never, no one will ever come and give me. So um, that is the reason why in the last 10 or 15 years, I haven't really published or, or done much of it. I'm, I'm still following the phenomenon. Uh, the most important thing about the crop sugar phenomenon is that there is a lot going on, which is just um, very peculiar and not easily explained. And that is something that is very hard to, to convey to the general, general, general public. Almost every article you read about crop circles starts with mystery and blah, blah, and aliens. And, and always at the end, there's a simple explanation of uh, guys with boards and ropes that, that do that stuff, that create this formation, which of course happens. You know, I'm, nobody ever said, well, a few people said that it wasn't the case. And on most crop circle researchers I know understand that. And I know, I mean, even make crop circles myself. So yeah, sure, there are many people making them, there are artists making them, but that's not the point. The point is that Underneath all the, the media articles and all the hoaxes and all the jokes and all the artwork, um, there is a phenomenon which is just extremely weird and which has, which, which just cannot be explained. I'm just, uh, in the books I wrote, I, I actually, the reason I wrote my books was to explain that the crop circle is phenomenon is not so simple and cannot be easily explained. Um, and simple examples, very simple examples are a formation that I saw, for example, in the field of carrots. So, you know, the carrots, carrot plants and all these orange things. And uh, when they're still in the soil, the, the, the leaves are actually sort of coming out. And there was a circle, not a circle, it was a weird shape, a rectangle, a rectangle with a couple of lines and so on. Or all these carrot leaves had been, it looked like they were cooked. They were dark green instead of fresh green of the rest. They were flattened against the soil and they were following the ridges on the soil. You know, the, the soil sort of plowed into, into, into ridges and, and they were actually sort of draped and following perfectly the surface of the earth. And they were all going into one direction at the left side of that rectangle and all in the opposite direction at the, at the right side of that uh, rectangle. And in the center, there was a whole row of carrot plants. I'm talking about 200 or 300 which had half of the leaves bent in one direction, the other half in the other direction. The plants were like that. And if you look at that, at the same time, you see that the soil is so soft and brittle that there's no way you can walk there because if I, if I stepped on it, I just sank away by, by three, four, four inches. You couldn't walk there without even footsteps in the, in, in the soil. There were no footsteps, okay? And then again, how would you ever, why would you ever do this in the first place? Well, I can understand why, but how would you do it? How do you make a rectangle of, I think something like 50 by 20 meters and one by one cook all the carrot leaves because they were sort of, they, they had been heated, cook them, then drape them, <laughs> cool them, put them in the right direction, hang them upside down from a hot air balloon or something. I don't, how do you do that? 
there's no simple, I'm not saying nobody can do it. I'm just saying that nobody has ever given me a plausible explanation of how you can do that. And there are many examples that are very similar, um, uh, formations in, in potato fields, same, same story, potato plants that are sort of in a large circle and are spiraled and all the stems have been burned very locally. There's the, the stems are sort of burnt locally over about one inch where the stems are completely dehydrated and that's what made the plants fall over. How do you make that? And without leaving imprints in the soil, you know, and it, so, and, there, and I saw many of those examples. And when you see that once, then no matter what other, other people say or say about you, you, know, you keep going to the next drop circle to save you. It's again like that. So something very strange is happening there, has been happening there. I don't know what's going on. I've been studying this for, I don't know, ever since 1988 or something, like, like almost a century ago, <laughs> almost. And the more I, I look at it, the more I think about it, the less I understand it. So it's, it's a very complex problem, apart from the hoaxes and the artwork, clearly, you know, which is not the point, and which is unfortunately where most of the articles are, uh, have been written about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I think even the ones that are man-made, um, you know, whatever anybody thinks, even some of those that, that were made, there is, there's interesting geometrical connections that if people yeah. are making them, there are some interesting geometric uh, principles that are coming out of those that I think that the crop circle makers, the, the mammy one, they may not even be consciously aware of what they're doing. They may have gone out there it's to make a cool one. design, but other people are finding uh, very interesting geometric connections in there, like squaring the circle that they may not have even been consciously aware of, which opens up a whole other area of conversation. Yeah, but that is true. There, there, there are various as aspects about the crop circles. I mean, the simple observations that defy any, any logic uh, is one of them, which I just mentioned. But the geometry is another one. And, and that is very really peculiar because uh, I've studied the geometry of crop circles a lot because I like mathematics. And there are all kinds of uh, consistent um, principles that, that, are, uh, that you can find in these formations. And then the skeptics will say, yeah, but if you're looking for something, you'll always find it. But those arguments are not valid. And you, you can perform uh, like a, um, statistical analysis on the P values and stuff. You know, that, that's no point. There are consistent geometrical properties um, that, that, are, uh, that manifest themselves in these crop circles. And the strange thing is that uh, sometimes crop circle makers, human crop circle makers, in fact, as you say, uh, created them too. The point is what you talk about we ask them, why did you do it that way? They don't know. And they say, well, we, we just make them. It's not that we are mathematicians or something. We just create these things. And then all of a sudden, now you can say, well, that because, that's because you have a rope of fixed length, you know, and it sort of leads to, that is not true. Um, there are in many, well, quite a bit of, of uh, stories. I know one which was very interesting was, uh, Human crop circle makers, I think it was Rod Dickinson, I'm not sure, again, like 20 or 25 years ago. Anyway, there were two crop circles that had been formed overnight somewhere in uh, Wiltshire in England. And then the night after, a third crop circle appeared. And that one was man-made, and we knew it. And uh, it turned out it was Michael Glickman who discovered it, that those three crop circles were, create, were made in a perfect equilateral triangle. So they were over a scale of, I think there was like, like 20 miles or something like that, so sort of like the equilateral triangle within an accuracy of 0.01%, I mean, crazy. I mean, it was like a perfect, but so the third crop circle was put right in between the same distances as the previous two. And when you talk to the, to the guys that made it, you, because he asked them, you know, why did you make the crop circle on that field at that point? Because he figured they have. Um, and they say, well, we just went to the bar and we, as always, and we had a few drinks and we had some, some dinner and we waited until it was dark and we drove off and we went into a field that looked right, and we just went in there, and we until we we stopped and it felt the right place, and we made it there. We didn't really plan it or think about it at all. And yet, you know, if you look at this, that's crazy, right? So you're funny. right. There seems to be some kind of, of external influence that influences even the human crop circle makers. I've heard many stories uh, that that sort of seem to suggest that. Interesting, weird. So, 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 so Michael Glickman, he, he saw that there was two unexplained formations and then there was a third one that shot, that popped up that was man-made. Yeah. Well, well, one strange, well, we didn't know there were two ones that appeared and didn't know where it came from. The third one was man-made and it was one day after. 
And then uh, it turned out to be perfectly aligned with the other two. And this was, by the way, long before um, the cell phones with GPS uh, software and so on. And this was, you know, this summer 1998 or something, 99, I don't know. But um, today it would be easier to do it, you know. Maybe at that point of accuracy, it would still be pretty hard. But we all have the technology to find a certain place on Earth and, and go there. Back then, it was not available at all. So you, you really needed, I don't know, some very sophisticated equipment, it's very costly. But then again, those guys are not interested in these kinds of jokes. You, know, you just go out there until it feels good, and then they make that circle. And that's what most of the human crop circle makers I spoke to also said. You know, it's not like we're, it's, it's art, you know, where we follow our feelings and we express ourselves the way we think it should be done. And we don't really think about all the mathematics. And yet, oh, yeah. mathematics comes out nevertheless. Yeah, always. Yeah, that's very interesting. Michael Glick, toward the end of his life, he was hardcore that, that, it was all real, but maybe because he was connecting those dots that there's something going on with man-made ones and then the ones that are a little bit more anomalous. Um, he was convinced that, that uh, the phenomenon itself was, was much bigger and something very strange was going on, whether they were man-made or not. He said it didn't matter if they were man-made. Yeah, in the end, maybe that's also true. Um, like I said, I made crop circles uh, just to uh, study the reactions of people because, you know, I wanted to know what, what do crop circles do to people and could it happen to me? Uh, so I created circles and in fact, some of my circles were declared genuine by some people as well. And they felt all kinds of energies and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, which was interesting, you know, because then again, it doesn't mean they're not there or they're wrong, or maybe it is there and I don't know, you know, but they also made crop circles for scientific studies. And, um, I've never found any anomaly, any biological anomaly in the circles that I made. So I replicated circles, which were identical to ones that had all kinds of weird biological anomalies, like differences in, uh, in germination growth and, um, uh, node length increase, that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. so we made circles in exactly the same crop, the same, the, the same type of crop, the same location, same time of the year, the same dimensions, everything. We did exactly the same experiments with the same protocols and compared the results and Another paper I published, I think, 10 or 15 years ago. And then you see that it doesn't happen. So I know that if you make the circles with the boards and ropes, you cannot reproduce all these weird biological um, anomalies that, uh, that have been reported. So something else must have been going on. Yeah. Yeah, something else I find interesting about that is, um, y you know, Carl Jung, you know, famously said that, you know, mandala making and these patterns making are good for people that have uh, psychological disorders. And now there's companies out there mapping the human brain and they're finding that the mind is quite geometrically organized. So I'm wondering if EB even just drawing the, the formations out or uh, seeing a formation in the field, if it does something to the mind and the body and if it could possibly explain at least some of these strange phenomena that people have when they go in them, when they observe them. Um, I find that very interesting. It is very interesting indeed. And, uh, like I said, maybe it's just a simple fact that you're away from your daily office job and taking some time for yourself to just switch off your brain and, and, um, get absorbed into whatever you, you, you want to be in. Um, or maybe it's more than that is the, the geometry, but, or anything else, but, um, I've seen animals getting sick inside crop circles and then you wonder, you know. Is that also imagination or does, yeah, does, does the dog just think he is sick or is it between his ears or is it really something going on? I've had a, a failure of my equipment, my, my photo camera inside crop in a way, which is completely incomprehensible. It was a very good photo camera. It never let me down. And that time it, well, it went all over the place. So, and I'm not the only one, right? It, I say the the one, one. It, yeah, it could be a coincidence, but they all add up. And uh, in the end, you start wondering, I don't know. It's, it's weird. It's, there's no easy explanation. I mean, you, you can always say it's a coincidence, but at the end, that is not really a satisfactory explanation at all. So I think there's something else going on. So summarizing the crop circle phenomenon is there's a lot of artwork and, and, and pranksters and everything. We know that. Yes, we know, but there is something underneath there, which has not been explained until today. And I'm still very curious, but I don't know what to do. I have to figure it out quite honestly. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think, I don't know what people can do. I know there's lots of researchers out there doing, doing some great work and, and, and studying it, but I still think there's a lot of meat on the bone there to be uncovered. And I think something will be launched from this 
maybe not in our lifetime, but if people keep digging into this and getting more bits of evidence, studying them, I think, you know, there's something positive that could be launched from this, but, um, yeah. And, uh, I, I really want to thank you for your time, El Joe. This has been one of the more fascinating conversations we've had on the show. Um, tell people how they can find you, you know, what, um, what are you up to lately? What, how can people find your books and all that? Um, I think the best, best way is just to type my name into Google somewhere and then you will, you will definitely find me. If you want to know more about relativity, Google Hasselhoff acceleration relativistic, and then you're there. The paper is out, it's, it's public domain. So everybody can, can read it. Yeah. I would love to hear from other people. I would love to, um, to hear from more us, other scientists, other people that have ideas, uh, please get in touch. Let's discuss this. And like I said, I'm not insisting to be right. I'm not saying any, any, uh, anyone made mistakes, but I think it's a very interesting step forward, um, to, uh, to provide new insight and, and also to make physics simpler, which is good now because physics is complicated enough as it is. So anything you can do to make it a bit simpler, uh, I think it's a good improvement. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a scientist, but I would imagine, um, the scientific community gets a little bit, gets a little bit difficult when, when there's new ideas in there, but it should be the opposite. We should, we should be open to new ideas and new thoughts and there should be debates about that. And so that that's what pushes the, the field forward. Absolutely. I, I agree with you. I agree with you. And you're right. I mean, scientists often are quite traditional and quite not always open for change. Which is maybe good because if you change every day, you know, it doesn't work either, but uh, at least you should discuss things and also discuss the contents and, and play on the game and play the game, not play on, on the person. And so, like I said, I'm always open for discussions and, uh, because it's, it's extremely, extremely interesting. I'm both prop circles that you don't understand, but also the whole, um, four dimensional universe theory. I, I think it, it's really fascinating if you, if you think about things that have been the case for 13 Point eight billion years, you know, I mean, wow, that is, uh, it's a privilege to, to be able to think about that, you know, as a human. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. I'm going to put links for all your work in the description below. Um, oh, I appreciate that. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. If you don't mind hanging out for a few minutes, I'm just gonna hit the record button. Thanks everybody for tuning in. We'll see you guys next time. Thank you very much, uh, Matt. Thanks. Take care. Thanks for watching the show. I hope you guys are enjoying the content. If you're finding any value, please hit that subscribe button, that like button, and leave a comment. It doesn't cost you anything, and it really helps out the show.